complaints about my volumes, um, so I'm not sure. Smaller room, it should be okay. Yeah. But yeah, but not when everybody's talking. Yeah. Um, it, All right. I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Is everyone ready for tonight? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Connie, for joining us here yeah. as she is speaking about outward incarnational focus. Okay. So yeah. you do. I, use, I used this successfully on Sunday. Yeah. Just use the arrow buttons. Yeah. My um, retention might not be great. So, <laughs> anyway. Outward incarnational focus is an interesting phrase, and I don't know how many people have figured out exactly what it means, um, or whether you thought of a different way of um, a different way of phrasing it. But if you do think of a different way of phrasing it before the end of the oh, I touched something. Um, before the end of the evening, please let me know, or add it to the bottom of your a list of questions, which we'd like to collect when we're done. Okay, we're going to start with a prayer, have introductions, scripture, discussion, small group activity, which will be discussion, and have a prayer. Okay, so can we read this together? Lord, Lord make this make this reflection reflection really well. Well. Call us into new places of service and growth. Fill us with courage to open doors a bit wider and reach out still further than we are comfortable. Strengthen our communities to bear love into difficult situations and find common concern with those we often overlook. Teach our hearts to seek out those whom we push to the margins of our lives our congregations, and our communities. Help us to become more Christ-like this day. Amen. And to go through it again, um, the directions were emphasize the words we found um, most meaningful, I guess. Um, so we can read it again and, and focus on what's been highlighted in the so. Lord, may this be a reflection of your love. Call us into new places of service and growth. Fill us with the courage to open doors a bit wider and reach out still further than we are comfortable. Strengthen our communities to bear love into difficult situations and find common concern with those we often overlook. Teach our hearts to seek out those whom we push to the margins of our lives, our congregations, and our communities. Help us to become more Christ-like this day. Okay, introduce yourself. So, tell us your name, give us a fun fact about you, and what do you think of when you hear the word right? Okay, you want to start with David? I do want to <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Marquis. I've been a member of Valley for many years. Um, fun fact about me, um, when I was in high school, I drove a Model A Ford as my basic transportation. How old are you? <laughs> That would be even more fun. <laughs> it wasn't new. And what do you think of oh. when you hear the word Bible? Um, I think strength. Okay. Cheryl? Um, I'm Cheryl Hoffbeck, and um, a fun fact. Uh, I was on the Wheel of Fortune twice. Ooh. 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 <laughs> and um, let's see. Uh, I think when I hear the word vital, I think um, like vitality, healthy, youthful, um, like like a fullness. Yeah. Hi, I'm Glennis Craig, and. 
Let's see, this last weekend I was covered pretty much head to toe in mud. There were some uh, weed pulling at my parents' house, and it was very wet out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I think of the word vital, I think of energized. Joyce? Um, my name is Joyce Wood. Uh, fun fact uh, my middle name is Suarez, S U A R E Z. Um, oh, it's family nice. name from Spain. Um, my sister has the same middle name. Um, hmm. And uh, vital, um, lively, I guess. Hmm. Great. I'm Greg Russell. Fun fact. Um, I got severe, severe vertigo. If I stand in the chair, I'll get vertigo for real. But I have a pilot's license in spite of that. <laughs> I've had it for years. If I'm enclosed in the plane, it doesn't. I don't feel it. If like I, if I can fall out or, yeah, then I feel it. Uh, vital for me is necessary for life. It's what required for an organism to thrive and to be successful. Jeff? I'm Jeff Bender. Uh, Fun fact about me is that I review running shoes, Ooh. and I get them for free, which is nice. Oh, and, <laughs> and I get to keep them. Yeah, and I get to keep them. Yeah. So I do that in my spare time, and that's part of my hobby of running. Um, and then what I think of when I hear the word vital, I was actually thinking about something related to um, Paul Galbraith's devotion that um, some of you may be reading along with also, and I think of the wind and uh, the idea of the wind is sort of the breath of God. So I'm making that connection. Um, okay. um, I am Liz Brown and uh, this past Sunday I rode six different water slides. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Three water slides twice each. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess that probably home. wasn't locally. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a bucket list? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was rather proud of myself for climbing the stairs that many times. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and when, when I hear the word vital, I think necessary. But when I hear the word vitality, I think energized. And I'm having a hard time thinking about a fun fact about you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I do remember this was a long time ago that I, my husband uh, was thinking he might get a promotion and I said, well, I'll, I'll move anywhere and I'm in anywhere in Washington State. <laughs> and he came home and said, guess what, we're moving to Great Falls, Montana. <laughs> I thought it, I really enjoyed it. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to live there. <laughs> <laughs> One thing called, is a wonderful right? Presbyterian church, and the people are very, very uh, kind and uh, wanting to help you in any way they can. Uh, that was, it, There were some good things about it, but it was the weather. Because <laughs> he traveled all the time because he was a district manager. So he was gone Monday morning and came home Friday night, and all he wanted was a nice home cooked meal. And all he wanted to do was go somewhere. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <laughs> what do you think of when you hear the word vital? Vital is it's very, very important, it's necessary to concentrate on what is happening. Okay. Well, I'm a third generation Idahoan, but I moved over the border into Jordan Valley, Oregon. And we had most of the time electricity and most of the time running water. There was <laughs> no phone, no television, um, not a lot to do in terms of what kids want to do. So I learned that I could roller skate on Highway 95 <laughs> <laughs> and not get hit by a truck because you can see him coming from right, a long right. way. <laughs> but um, 
there were only two churches there, Catholic, which was Latin at the time, and uh, Methodist, and we had church on Mondays, Oregon allowed it from two to three in the afternoons, one day a week. So that was our church on Mondays. Once in a while, a minister would come out, some practicing person from, I, um, oh gosh, the College of Idaho. They would come and, and speak on Sunday, so we would go there. I mean, they, it was in English, so that helped. <laughs> so, um, when I think of the word vital, I think breathing, because I was a hospice nurse. So mm -hmm. vital to me is, you know, they're, they're still viable, they're still breathing, they're still with us. And your name? Oh, Kathy Bach. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Okay, Donna Carlson. Uh, fun fact about me. Um, boy, there's a lot of them, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into them. Um, I enjoyed hang gliding when I was young. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Obviously, give it up because I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think of when you hear the word vital? You know, like you said, necessary. It's definitely something that's necessary to do. Okay. And what about you, Connie? Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, Connie Brenner. Um, <laughs> and fun fact about me. Uh, I used to be a Mazana um, and climbed the, the peak that I climbed to get my, you know, to be a member was the middle sister. Which was, oh. a, which was an overnight thing, so uh -huh. that, was, that was interesting. And on the Zoma trip, I climbed the highest mountain in, in uh, Norway, which that's deceptive because the highest mountain in Norway is not real high. <laughs> 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 but it is covered with ice and snow because it's so far north. Um, you know, it kind of makes up in latitude for what it likes. <laughs> 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 And I think of, when I hear the word vital, um, something that's necessary. Okay, and here's uh, the thesaurus um, definition with all kinds of synonyms. Um, crucial, key, indispensable. Lively, energetic, active. So there's sort of two, you know, two takes on it, but um, spunky, I like that one. <laughs> Full, of Full of beans. Full of beans, yeah. <laughs> okay, outward incarnation focus. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Um, what we're looking for is outward exploration, awareness, and focus on neighbors and neighborhood. Beyond relationship with those who are like us, the incarnate Christ dwells among the lowly and least, the stranger and the suffering, the marginalized and minority. Um, I think in shorthand, what I usually think of when I think of those groups are the other. Mm -hmm. and our tendency to turn anybody that's a little different from us into the other, uh, which makes them a little bit less than fully human. Um, and I think that's one of the dangers we, we face when we start making differences between people. The missional focus on where Christ is already living and present and calling us to dwell. Okay, it's a long scripture. This is half of it. Um, oh, I don't want to read it by myself. Uh, when the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, 
Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And the last part of it is, then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And you know, share what speaks to you or how this speaks to you. Anybody? One of the reasons I, I love the Good Samaritan story is because at the end, when they asked Jesus, you know, who is my neighbor? He said, who did the man who was injured say helped him? You know, so it's looking at the people who are marginalized and saying, who helped you? It's, it's from their point of view, not necessarily from ours. And, and I think it's why the story of the Good Samaritan is, is so fantastic, because he really turned the world upside down. Yeah. I think it gives goats a bad rep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I raised sheep, and I could never understand this. <laughs> they're, they're stupid. <laughs> They'll die. <laughs> the goats will take care of themselves. <laughs> well, goats die too, but um, <laughs> my sister raised pygmy goats. She had like, at one point had like 40 of them, and then um, they were... I think they're a lot more entertaining than sheep. Mm -hmm. I think mean, blackberries <laughs> there. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> and curtains. That's, I think what's good about this is it's just really crystal clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the parables you have to really think and guess, but this is like marching orders, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when did I see you? Right there. Mm -hmm. That one right there, right here. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a direct answer to a question. And I think in all these categories of people, they are <coughs> often people we tend to see as the other, or people who aren't like us. Okay, this sum um, comes at the end of Matthew's. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how they phrased it, a scatological movement. <laughs> it's one of the last of Jesus' great sermons. An answer for people who wonder what actions in their lives have given glory to God and where have they let opportunities pass them by. One of the points I liked is that both groups, the sheep and the goats, but the left hand and right hand people, share an unawareness of the idea that the least of these in need or distress is a proxy for the Son of Man. They don't see the, the parallel there that you know they're being talked to told about. In both instances the Son of Man does not identify with the groups, but with the one needing care. The sheep are not rewarded for being nice to the sheep, nor are the goats for punished for their inattention to the other goats. 
The praise or condemnation is only in response to their approach with the other. The other is the one who needs. Can you think of other areas, I mean, besides hungry, um, naked, in prison, et cetera, that, you know, that are used in the, um, let's see, how do I go back? She's the arrow button. Yeah. Okay. Um, hungry, thirsty, stranger, and of course the stranger um, in a lot of translations is the alien. And the Old Testament prophets are just replete with um, the instructions that you're to care for the widow, the orphan, and the alien who in that society were people who didn't have anybody else to, take care of to rely them. on. Mm -hmm. um, so stranger, naked, sick, and in prison. And you know, we tend to think a little harshly sometimes of people who are in prison. Well, I think of homeless people quite a bit when for a number of reasons, but <clears throat> they're so visible, yeah. and they're so, um, it's hard not to be, it's hard not to be judgmental about mm -hmm. why. And heaven forbid that we would be there ourselves. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> um, I was sort of driving through Portland today with my sister, we were kind of like commenting on that, mm -hmm. and you can't hardly not comment mm -hmm. on it, but yeah. it's like, ooh, what, how can we even relate to what that must be like? And, um, but they, and then we were commenting that in traveling in other countries, and we just came back from you know, Mexico and such, and it's like, you know, it's like I realized about halfway through, it's like we're not seeing homeless people, mm -hmm. at least in the way we see them here. And so when you were attesting to how the, the um, people are cared for in that society, or like in the Old Testament, it's like care for those who have not. Um, I think in a lot of cultures that are also, um, well, they, they, where they're more family oriented and stable, that is, it's like, well, they must be taken care of their own, or if they don't they yeah. have somebody, then, then somebody else must be helping take care of them. I mean, it's that, you see a lot of people maybe sitting around not doing anything, but you don't see people living in tents or, or right. you know, There might be stores. 10 people in the hut, but they're in the hut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I mean, it's something, of course, mm -hmm. there's so many people here that we don't have solutions for, but it's, Obvious that how we, how more privileged we are than we have ever even taken ourselves to be granted for. It's like, well, we really are, and not to be judgmental at the same time. Yeah. You as you're saying, it's like, how could you live like that? Yeah. Well, you know, some you know, like every once in a while they'll um, profile a family that, mm -hmm. you know, your one job <clears throat> loss or one mm -hmm. bad diagnosis or one. Mm -hmm. Serious accident yeah. away from losing everything you have. Yeah. Yeah. And one man that was interviewed was a practicing lawyer, and due to his alcoholism and other issues, of course, he lost his practice. Mm -hmm. His wife left. The house probably went to the wife. I don't remember that detail. So, boom, he was homeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went from I don't know how much money they make, but you know, it went from a paying job to nothing. Yeah. And because they were interviewing different people along the way, you know, why are you here? Why are you here? That kind of thing. And and uh, I I was not surprised, but a little stunned that somebody with that much of an education. And mm -hmm. so it isn't just people that you know dropped out of high school or whatever. There are well-educated people out there that just had tragedies happen. Mm -hmm. 
so or mental illness. Is it yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it feeds back a lot for me to a lot of the stuff that we talked about week one in terms of the, um, like all of the different apps, you know, that you would use to connect with someone because you don't have your own community. You have to pay someone to hold your hand and walk you around town. <laughs> um, and like, it is an American phenomenon that we move away, you know, the extreme independence and manifest destiny of like, my mom is 1,500 miles away. Like an individual. You know, like, so when, like, if we each took a moment here, like, take 10 seconds and think about if it was you, where would you go? Mm -hmm. Who do you have? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have people in Idaho and Chicago. Mm -hmm. Where do you go now? Do you know what I mean? Do you drive to Idaho? Do you drive to yeah. Chicago? Like, do you call your neighbor? Do you have a neighbor that you could crash on the floor with? You know, when when the um, I had said something when the Eagle Creek was on fire, mm -hmm. right? And it was coming east, and uh, and I said, if I can get to church, I'll be okay. And they're like, but that's on the clear on the other side of the river, you know. I was like, sure, but if I get to church, there's 130 people who know me and love me and might have a basement, a spare room. You know what I mean? That like if, if something went down and flooded our <coughs> East End apartment, you know, like whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but that's right, looking in, like is that an other or is that an not? Like I expect my community to take care of me, kind of. How do we yeah. open out that community? How do I, you know, who am I willing to take care of? Yeah. The same way? Not necessarily someone you've got a connection with, too. Yeah. Glennis? Joyce commented earlier that that scripture was very clear. And, you know, the United States likes to call itself a Christian nation. <laughs> so I, I'm having problems <laughs> reconciling that. Yeah. If, if we are not doing something, you know, that Jesus said like that, are we still a Christian nation? Do we have the right to call ourselves that? Well, one thing I always like to say is that as members of a democracy, we are responsible for what our government does and doesn't do. And that's, you know, we are, you know, we need to make our voices heard because it's our country. It's not <clears throat> somebody else's country. I've got um, two comments real quick, if I have time. Uh, one is I used to go to Japan all the time for work and I never saw Japanese homeless because the family had a responsibility. So if someone had a problem, it was the family would take care of the person. Um, the other one in terms of the comment about this, things are crystal clear, if you go earlier in the, uh, the chapter, you have the story of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom and five of them brought extra mm -hmm. oil. And when the ones that didn't have and needed asked the other ones for the oil, to share the oil, they said no. <laughs> so that's yeah. in, in conflict with yes. this in terms of interpretation. So there's nothing that's really uh, crystal clear, I think, when they read the Bible. It's always, a, it's always a challenge. I remember one of the nurses at the hospital telling me, like when, when Duncan was first born, of, of um, like gather your village, you know, kind of stuff. Because in like in China, a baby does not touch the ground. Those feet don't touch the ground for the first year. Yeah. There, there are always arms. You know, there's aunties and, and grandmas and neighbors and you know whatever that is. And that's and they are not alone in that. You know, mm -hmm. um, but it is again a very Americanized. Um, you know, new American moms are isolated in ways that that other people are not you know because building that village if you don't already have it yeah okay um where are we doing okay we're going to divide up into small groups and there's the, the questions are on two screens so um, it's the same as on the paper. They're the same as on the paper, so if you want to, maybe the table that you're sitting at. Um,
we've talked about with the whole group, and I'll try to keep that a little shorter than, than the first part. Um, so, does anyone over here have anything um, that they want to share that was talked about? Wow. Well, <laughs> um, I think we spent a fair amount of time talking about um, different kind of like program. I mean, I, can I say like support groups? Like if we had mm -hmm. this, uh, our latest topic in the room was like having a grief support group, you know, mm -hmm. or like having um, you know seminars on how to deal with um, racism confrontations mm -hmm. in the community if we came up against yeah. it, or um, for widows or widowers. Yeah. Well, yeah. <coughs> well, oh, no, that, that. Okay. and then about um, isolation. Of mm -hmm. folks that might be a nice uh, that might not have a support group yeah. or friends or to be able to reach out for assistance and help and making sh sure not just the deacons outreach but there's something beyond that and, um, and that as a geographically we're pretty isolated here from and from a lot of exposure to those Others. others in the world. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, lively conversation over here. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about altering your perspective. You know, whether it's taking a different route on your, you know, driving a different route during the week, sitting in a different spot on Sunday. Finding ways to like, how do you open your eyes? Was how was was what that came out of, and it's like, how if I'm gonna walk a mile in your shoes, I gotta go find somebody's shoes, right? So how do I go find their shoes? I gotta, I don't know what it's like on the right side of the church. I always sit boarded out on the left. What's it, you know? What's it like <laughs> in the balcony? <laughs> you know, like I don't know, you know. But like even that shift would tell me, <laughs> would tell me. Well, in front of the speaker and behind the speaker are two different experiences, though. That, that's I know that. But like shifting your perspective even within the group, you know, within our comfort bubble of our sanctuary, and then like. I need to go grocery shopping. What if I go to a different Winco this week instead? You know, what if I go to the Fred Meyer down the street instead of the one right next door? Do I see different people? Do I? Is that still my community? Go to Winco. What's it like? <laughs> right? What if I go to Winco instead of Fred Meyer? You know, like what do I? What do I experience amidst the the people, all of whom are still made in God's image? You know, amongst those those people. So it's kind of how do you shift perspective to start seeing others. I remember an anecdote that Glory Rodman once shared with us, and some of you remember Glory. Just a fountain of wealth and common sense knowledge. And they were transferred from the Northwest down to the deep South someplace, and she had never been around African Americans. Mm -hmm. And just you know, you drive by, you might have seen them at the bus stop as domestics going home or whatever, but you never, in Portland, it was pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. And she just didn't know how to deal with it. And so she decided that she would um, just say to herself every time she came up to somebody, and kind of just say to herself, God bless you. God nice. bless you. And it was like, you know, it sounds like a small thing, mm -hmm. but in doing so, she recognized, and and she was the type of person that recognized everybody as God's children anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, wow, you know, how do we do? We let our fears control us or our unknowns, but be gracious in accepting what is. Mm -hmm. So that little. Parable, I think, is always a nice way wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Homeless, whatever. Mm -hmm. It also changes. I think it visibly changes how you appear to the other person when you're saying that, too. Exactly. You know, because you're more likely to make eye contact or smile. Or, yeah. 
you're, you're recognizing their humanity. One of the things um, that struck me in one of our adult ed classes was um, being made in the image of God. And I think we have a tendency to think that, yes, we're all made in the image of God. But, you know, but so are they. Yep. I mean, you know, I mean right. yeah. they, you know, they're made in the image of God, too. And how can you hate somebody, you know, or look at them like they don't belong, or they don't deserve, or they don't, you know, if they're made in the image of God. I mean, they're not any, how could they be lesser than, you know, the people that are looking at them and saying, well, <laughs> you're different. There was a, um, that's my, at that conference that we went to down at OHSU, she was talking about how, like, if you're dining in a restaurant and we're having this great meal and we're in the, the light and we're having good food and and conversation and everything and the, the over the thing we can see it says open and there's these people outside looking in at us and we're like well it says open and we're all having a good time but do we think about when it says open to us that the people outside looking in it says close to them and how like you just think like why aren't they coming in why don't why don't they come in like it I can see it's all like, why aren't they coming in and joining us? This is just the time to so turn around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, it's always come on in. I'm like, gee, why are you just looking at us? Yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay, let me see if I got this right. Um, okay, there's a um, um, program in the PCUSA called Matthew 25 Churches. And that's, you know, the, the, the uh, scripture that we were just looking at. Uh, it calls us to actively engage in the world around us so our faith comes alive and go out of our church and act in the community. Um, act boldly and compassionately. And um, there's in, in the material online about it, it says, by accepting the invitation, you can help our denomination become a more relevant presence in the world. Mm -hmm. We recognize Christ's urgent call to be a church of action where God's love, justice, and mercy shine forth and are contagious. Um, there's some really interesting stories about uh, congregations that have really been revitalized by by taking on fairly significant outreach kinds of activities. Okay, so recapping, um, the, well, we talked about a lot of this. Um, it's. Um, There's potential outcomes from this, that congregation could be or is a noted presence in the community, needs are met, people feel welcomed, reconciliation and diversity help transcend culture. Uh, our community could be viewed as being more important to us than the church building. We're taking up God's mission. Um, tendency in a lot of churches to focus on the physical plant and make sure we're taking mm -hmm. care of that. Except for David. He can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it needs doing or, or we won't be here anyway, but it's, you know, if that's our whole focus, if all of our focus as a church goes into maintaining mm -hmm. our structure, our physical structure and our um, you know, what we do together, um, are we doing what we're here for? Uh, transformation and renewal of congregations. And we can see transformation and renewal of congregations that reflect the rich diversity of the kingdom of God. And we can shift from bringing in young people and young families to sending out, showing up, being present where God is already at work and many can come to know Christ their Savior. So that's, um, so 
in terms of outward incarnational focus, that's, um, that's what it means, but um, did anybody come up with something that, that um, sounds a little easier to understand or maybe is in a little more plain English? Being Jesus to the world? Yeah, Molotov? Being Jesus to the world? How about shepherding the other or the others? Mm -hmm. Shepherding. Yeah, the I others. like seeing others and serving others. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we can close with this prayer. Connie, before you start, um, this is the first time I've heard of the PCUSA Matthew 25 church program. Oh, yeah, I've never heard of it. Yeah, is anybody else? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so the reason I, I haven't brought it up, at least, is because it came after the Vital Congregations Initiative. Oh, so it's brand new. And it's the same it's office, okay. actually. And I, I didn't want to introduce it here because I want to focus on Vital Congregations first. <laughs> I, I was just wondering, you know, as, you know, follow-up conversations, perhaps something around, do, do they have materials and things? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's very similar, actually. Okay. Um, and so maybe what comes out of, like this process for Bible Congregations is that we want to explore becoming a Matthew 25 church. I think it'd be a neat, natural um, step. Yeah. Thank you for finding that and bringing it up. Oh, it's, I think it's probably Presbytery where I've run into it. Um, I think that's where I became aware of it. Yeah, I saw the Presbytery news. Yeah. And I did, does, do people here get stuff from the national uh, denominational offices or? Just Presbytery. I get the Presbyterian stuff, not, yeah, not the general you know, stuff. Oh, okay, because there's like weekly newsletter things, and it's kind of interesting sometimes when I, I don't always read them, <laughs> depending on how much time I have to spend at the computer. But, there's a lot from the Presbyterians itself, so. Yeah, there is, but it's kind of interesting sometimes. And, and they get, they also send out like calls to act, um, to write letters about certain things to your congressional representatives and um, you know in terms of social justice issues and that sort of thing so I don't know maybe we ought to publicize some of those websites that, you know that, you know make it a little easier for people to get that kind of information and not everybody wants it but if we said you know if you want to get a a uh, weekly newsletter from the General Assembly, um, sign up here or something. Well, the Vital Congregations team is working with small groups and adult ed um, elders to start, you know, looking at maybe logical next steps um, mm -hmm. for follow-ups to each of these sessions. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something that would be a natural fit. Okay. So shall we close with the prayer? Yes. Lord, help us to see your face in the faces of our neighbors who are in need. In need of food, clothing, shelter, acceptance, kindness, companionship. We're told that there will be need in your age. Help us to understand that all of our fellow humans were also made in your image and that they deserve the love and respect that resemblance deserves, and help us understand how best we can be involved in sharing your love. Amen. Good prayer. Okay. So next week we'll keep this going here. Week four will be on a servant leadership, which should be really neat. And I believe Carolyn is leading it. I think so. I think Carolyn is leading that. Ross and Saul. Yeah, I think so. So should we get so Wednesday at six? We'll be back. Or Sunday. Or Sunday.